all of you. We welcome you again to another webinar in our CPD program series. Uh, today we have to talk about a very important topic, a very common topic that we all have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in our daily practices. The topic today is sleep, how to do it right, and what to do if it goes wrong. As usual, this webinar link will be available from 9 to 9.50 a.m. for you to join in, and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points, and these CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. This is to improve and maintain the standards of our CPD program, and we thank you for adhering to these rules and regulations and for your kind compliance. As usual, we want you to switch off your video and to mute your microphones during this session to avoid any interruptions. We will also post our mobile number in the chat box. If you do get logged out due to the power outage, please don't hesitate to contact us and send us your name so that we can add you back into the program. Also, we would like to tell you that our chat option will be open. So any queries you have during this session, please uh, feel free to type in so that we can discuss this at the end of our session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our distinguished guest today. Uh, our, our guest is Dr. Ruanti Jayasekara. She's the acting consultant respiratory physician attached to the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So, madam, the floor is over to you. Okay, uh, good morning. I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, so, um, uh, I'm Dr. Ruanti Jayasekara, and thank you for the introduction, Ramali. Uh, so, we are, today we are going to talk uh, about sleep. So we've been sleeping uh, throughout our whole lives, but do we actually know uh, what's going on in sleep and how do we sleep right? And if we encounter any problem uh, during sleep, how do we uh, identify them, manage it? So I'm sure all of you have come across um, not only patients, friends, relatives, uh, telling you about sleep and uh, when things go wrong. And uh, when, it, when it comes to sleep medicine, um, the knowledge is actually quite new. Um, sleep has been has become a, a subject in medical schools, uh, mainly in Western countries over the past uh, decades, and um, and it's it's been introduced into our local syllabuses only recently. So I think it's uh, time for us to uh, know about uh, sleep, how to do it right, and what to do if it goes wrong. So. Um, this will be the outline of my talk. I'll go through uh, a few case figments. I, uh, I will not touch on the diagnosis when I discuss the cases, but you can find out at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll see what happens in sleep, how many hours should we sleep, why do we sleep, poor sleep and consequences, how do we sleep right, sleep disorders, and I will also touch on shift work and jet lag. I was very happy to receive a lot of questions and I will be addressing most of them during the presentation. But still, if you have some more queries, please um, put them in the chat box and we'll try to answer to uh, the best of our knowledge. So a first case. So there is a 50 year old man with severe high blood pressure who has uh, admitted to the ward and sent it to the intensive care unit because of a very high blood pressure. Um, and during the ICU stay, the nurses observe that, so you know, he's, he's attached to a lot of monitors and the nurses know that his oxygen saturation keep on swinging, it keeps on going down as he sleeps and the blood pressure also swings. So as you can see in this picture, he's a very obese man, he has a thick neck and uh, he has a bottle of alcohol in his hand and he has loud snoring in sleep. I'm sure you have guessed uh, the diagnosis. Um, uh, I'm sure you have suspected obstructive sleep apnea in this patient. Moving on to case two, a 20 year old college student or university student uh, who shares his room with a roommate with another university student. Okay, so he the roommate notices that his friend wakes up every night with, with a disturbed behavior during sleep. He will wake up about once a month and then he the, the patient will appear awake, confused, sweaty and very fearful. The roommate will attempt to calm him down, but in these episodes, this pa the patient's eyes are wide awake, he's very glassy eyed, and he will not respond to any questions. And most of the time, most of the time in the most of most nights in the month, he will abruptly wake up, sit around, look around, mumble something, and go back to sleep. So um, this disrupts his sleep almost every night, and he has 
daytime disruption. I'm sure you have you or you have you may have heard or you have experienced this kind of events in the night. Then moving on to case three. There is this young lady who is sleepy all the time. So she sleeps about seven to eight hours in the night, maybe more, but however much she sleeps in the night, she's always sleepy in the day. She sleeps even standing, she's sleeping. She she attends um, she attends activity, she falls asleep. She can't maintain wakefulness. And this has been going on since childhood. She has been a, she has been labeled as a lazy child in uh, during childhood, difficult in waking up in the morning. And she also describes this feature where she says when she wants to tell a joke or when she's feeling angry, she will suddenly collapse. She will suddenly feel very weak in the body. Her knees will buckle and she'll fall down. She has broken things. So she's an excessively uh, somnolent child or hypersomnolent person. So he, she needs further evaluation and you'll, I'm sure you will suspect the diagnosis, you may have suspected the diagnosis already, or uh, you will be able to uh, come to um, a differential diagnosis at the end of the presentation. Moving on to the last case, a 60 year old man who was evaluated for violent behavior during sleep. So he's, he's, he's a married man and um, his wife says that whenever he's, he's in a dream, he seems to be acting out the dream. He's having violent movements and he has hit his wife occasionally. He has gone out of the bed and when he's woken up from any of these episodes, he will say that he has been fighting an attacker or running away from wild animals. So again, let's look, we'll be able to find out the diagnosis. So sleep. We, we've been sleeping our whole life up to now. So what is sleep? So if you look at the definition, sleep is a reversible behavioral state of perceptual disengagement. So it's a behavioral state and you can come in and out of it and uh, you are disengaged from the environment and you are relatively unresponsive to the environment when you sleep. Of course, we know that. So commonly people ask, why do we sleep? What is the purpose of sleep? It's a waste of time. I mean, we can spend on doing lots of things when we are sleep instead of sleeping. So then I would like to put back to you the question uh, for those who are asking, what is the purpose of sleep? What is the purpose of wakefulness? So you may think that we are maintaining, maintaining wakefulness for reproduction, for studies, to do activities, uh, for eating, for traveling, but is that the actual purpose of wakefulness? Uh, it, it's actually kind of a self um, uh, self conversation. What is the purpose of wakefulness? But of course, let's find out what, what actually we know about the purpose of sleep. So, um, so sleep accompanies all of us, uh, all of our life, and we sleep about one third of our life. So if you think of a person who, who's lived uh, up to the uh, ripe age of 90, um, about 30 years of his life, he has spent in sleep. Overall, we have this idea that sleep fulfills essential functions in the brain and body. And it is also a sensitive marker of disease. And when you come, when you, for, and before discussing sleep disorders, we have to find out what is normal sleep. So, there is a lot of neurochemical and hormonal interaction that goes on in the brain during sleep. So um, there, when, you, when you look at a, a human brain, the EEG patterns, we, we categorize um, the EEG waves during wake and sleepiness to three broad stages, three vigilance states. You have the wakeful period and you have the sleep period and the sleep period is broadly divided into the slow wave sleep or the non-REM sleep and the REM sleep. So when you are awake, you are your eyes are open, you get a lot of inputs from, the, from things around you. You have visual input, you have auditory input, you have lots of perceptions and, and your EEG is very erratic, the high, um, the, the very high frequency waves uh, depending on the input that you get and very chaotic and you have a lot of muscle movement, eye movement. And then as you enter sleep, your EEG waves become slower and calmer. And as you enter the deeper and deeper sleeps, your high amplitude waves become nice and regular and ultimately achieve, achieve delta EEG waves. And there are, in each of these sleep stages, you also have sleep spindles and ripples, which are associated with memory formation, which you, we will uh, learn about in a little while. And then you move on to REM sleep, or the dreaming sleep, it is also called the paradoxical sleep. So in REM sleep, 
um, the EEG waves again become very similar to the wake period, but you're still sleeping. And if, so if you look at the EEG, you may think the patient is awake, but when you look at the patient, he's sleeping. So in this REM sleep or the paradoxical sleep, there are rapid eye movements, which uh, are specific for this uh, sleep. And if you have seen a little child, a baby sleeping, you may have noticed very rapid eye movements, which we can't voluntarily do. So that is happening in this sleep. And in this, I mean, I, I said that you have dreams during this uh, REM sleep and to stop us from acting our dreams, the brain sends inhibitory signals to our skeletal muscles to stop us from moving about in our dreams. So you, you may remember the last case where he has been acting our dreams, which is pathological. So the, apart from the diaphragmatic muscle, which helps you to breathe, and a middle ear muscle to help you to suddenly wake up from a loud noise, the rest of the skeletal muscle is atonic. And they, so that means it's basically paralyzed. So this is what goes on in a, a night's sleep. It is not a static state. We just don't go to sleep, sleep throughout the night in one static state and wake up the following morning. Some people have this uh, wrong idea that we should sleep from the beginning to the end. No, um, so uh, let's look at this sleep cycle. So during one night, you go through about five to six cycles of sleep. So you start off with this wake periods, so you're awake and you go to bed, and then you slowly fall in a drift into sleep. You start with the N1 sleep, which is called N1 in the non-REM sleep. Is, there are three parts, N1, N2, N3, and N1 sleep, you begin it, and then you do enter into deeper sleep and your EEG waves become slower and slower and you enter into deep sleep. And you can see that this N3, in the SN3 part, you have, that is the deeper sleep, there's a long period here, and then you lighten up and go into Dreaming sleep. So there is uh, the non REM sleep alternate with wakeful periods and REM sleep. So, in one, um, and when you look at the EEG pattern, there are many arousals and wakeful periods in the night. So, you may remember or re you may not remember waking up in the night, you can toss and turn and go back to sleep. Um, or you may not remember waking up at all, but there are lots of wakeful episodes going on in the night, uh, and that is perfectly normal, and you don't need to worry about it. You need to worry about it when it is a pathological state and that we will discuss about pathologies later on. So you can see how nicely the sleep cycles between in and out of wakeful non-REM and REM sleep. And you can also appreciate that these REM sleep or the dreaming episodes become longer and longer as the night progresses and uh, the, deep, the deep sleep is more in the beginning of the night rather than towards the end. And, um, when, and these REM episodes uh, or the dreaming sleep or the paradoxical sleep episodes, mm -hmm. even though the body is paralyzed, there's a lot of cardiorespiratory instability during this period. There are a lot of heart rate um, changes rhythm changes, blood pressure changes, respiratory irregularities. And you may remember, or you may know, recollect that you have a lot of myocardial ischemic episodes happening in the early hours of morning and scientists have correlated these uh, um, autonomic instability to these REM sleep episodes as well. Right. So sleep, so what puts you to sleep? Sleep is driven by two main things, the sleep pressure and your internal body clock. So the sleep pressure is how long since you last slept. So um, now it's the morning, you've just, you've woken up a few hours ago, you're still not very, you're, you're still not sleepy. If you are very sleepy at this time, it is not right. Um, uh, and I hope I don't put you to sleep uh, today. So, um, but, but you know, when it gives the afternoon uh, and when it gives to six, seven in the evening, you have been awake for about 15 hours. So after about 15 hours of wakefulness, the body wants to put you to sleep. And the more you stay awake, away from these 15 hours of wakefulness, the more sleepy you are. So the sleep pressure builds up. The other thing that puts you to sleep is your internal body clock. So each one of us has a clock inside us. And the main part of, and the main clock is in the hypothalamus. It is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus that decides our wake and sleep rhythm. So our body clock is timed at exactly 24.2 hours. So in the morning, 
it wakes you up. So there's a lot of interplay between the neurochemicals in the brain. There are a lot of glutamate, glycine, a lot of neurochemicals, a new, lot of neuro interconnected neurochemical pathways in the brain and the brain stem, as well as hormones like hypocretin and melatonin. Hypocretin is secreted by the hypothalamus. Melatonin is secreted by the little gland at the back of the brain called pineal gland. So there's interplay between these. And in the morning, you wake up. The hypocretin is the wakeful hormone. It wakes you up. And then as the time goes by, um, the, then the dusk sets in, the environment becomes darker. And in response to dusk, melatonin starts secreting. And then you are slowly made to feel sleepy. So, um, so these two are the main drivers of sleep. And when you start interfering with your sleep pressure artificially, or if something is pathologically going on in either of the sleep pressure or internal circadian clock, you start developing sleep disorders. Right. So how many hours should we sleep? That is a question that we get commonly asked uh, uh, by a lot of people, not only do doctors and uh, non-medical people. So they want to know, because, because we are in, in, in a society where um, every minute is precious. We, have, we are running against time. We have so much, so much of things to cover within the 24 hours given to us in a day. And we all, most of the time, we, we keep wishing that, that a day would be longer. Um, so most young adults report seven to eight hours of sleep. And mind you, this is, this is from population studies. So people have studied how many hours of average um, a young adult should, should sleep or, or average young adult, how many hours uh, does a uh, normal young adult sleep? Uh, and the average is seven to eight hours. But it is important to realize that there's a lot of inter-individual uh, variability. So you can find out whether you need seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, or it can be small as five hours, or it can be long as 10 hours. So to, to find out how many hours you need, I mean, there's one individual needs, you have to let yourself to fall asleep when you're feeling sleepy and wake up without an alarm on the following day and see how many hours um, uh, you have slept. So you have to do it a few days because you may be sleep deprived and on the first day you will sleep longer. But so you have to do a few days and see one every. So I know for myself, I need seven hours of sleep, natural sleep. So it is important to find out your number of hours of sleep and not to fight against it. If you need, if your body needs seven hours of sleep, you have to give it seven hours of sleep for efficient daytime functioning. So why we break sleep is to be more efficient, to do a lot of work. But ultimately what is happening will be the other the way around. So if you take a normal day to our, our, with our busy lifestyle, I think most of us goes to bed that night in midnight and wake up around 5 a.m. in the morning. And you can see um, what a lot of sleep deficiency gets accumulated. And some people will say that they will sleep about four to five hours during a weekday and then go to sleep longer in a weekend. But this, though you can do that, it does not uh, help in the long run to maintain, uh, to get the benefits of sleep, which I will discuss in, a, in the next few slides. Um, so actually, uh, I'm not just saying it uh, for the sake of saying it. There are studies uh, done. I would like to quote this study by Ben Dongal et al. in 2003. He actually put groups of people into sleep restriction to four to six hours per night for 14 days and monitored their behavior and have found out they get into significant cognitive decline and increased sleepness uh, when they are sleep restricted. So this is a chart of uh, the lifespan and how many hours of sleep you need during the lifespan. So you know a newborn child uh, will sleep most of the day, 14 to seven hours per day, and they will spend most of their sleep in deep sleep. And as they age, uh, the deep sleep component becomes, um, comes to a normal adult value and um, the sleep cycles get established. So if you have a child, if you have a toddler, 11 to 14 hours of sleep, if you have a preschool child, 10 to 13 hours of sleep. Now, you have, if you have a child who's getting ready for scholarship, 9 to 11 hours of sleep. And we know how parents pressure their children into online classes in the night, uh, excess, excessive activity. But in, in the hope of increasing the efficiency or in getting better results, but in the end, it is actually detrimental. So young adults, seven to nine hours of sleep. And after they pass the age of about 50 and 60 and reach the ripe age of 70 to 80 years of age, actually sleep requirement decreases. So most of the time they will need about five to six hours of sleep. 
the time they spend in deep sleep becomes less. That is, their increased sleep becomes less. Their sleep becomes more fragmented. It is important to be aware of this phenomenon because people start unnecessarily worrying. They come and tell me, I used to sleep well as a, as a young, as a youth. I used to be active. I'm still active, but I'm not sleeping enough. I feel I'm not sleeping enough. I tend to wake up early. So you have to have this knowledge to tell them confidently, don't worry. Uh, this is a normal phenomenon. Okay. <clears throat> so again, still behind, why do we sleep? So uh, these are quotes from literature. It's, the, it's called the death of each day's life. Balm of a hurt mind. So you know if you if you are if you're pressurized, if you have something to worry, you want to sleep it off. A good laugh and a long sleep are the best cures in a doctor's book, which I think we all agree. So uh, still we are at why do we sleep? Um, it is common to all animals, and it's interesting that uh, birds who are migrating across oceans over long periods actually uh, they, uh, one half of their brain go to sleep while another half of the brain remain active for vigilance. So there are lots of variations. When you, when, when you uh, look at the sleep in the animal kingdom, there are lots of beautiful variations. But what if you sleep deprived? So actually scientists have seen what will happen if you stop a person from falling asleep. So if you look at this, uh, this picture in the bottom, what is it? Can you figure out what it is? So here, so what they have done is an experiment. There's a big basin of water and there's a cogwheel over it and there's a rat sitting on the cogwheel. So for the rat to prevent itself from falling into the water and drowning, it has to keep on pedaling the cogwheel. So it feels on pedaling the cogwheel and the nutrition is given to the rat uh, to, st to stop it from exhaustion. So he goes on peddling, he's not uh, taking any rest, he's not allowing himself to sleep, and finally he falls asleep, he cannot keep himself awake, he falls asleep and dies. So sleep deprivation is that bad. So um, still we haven't come to the function, so one can think um, sleep is a highly maladaptive behavior given to us from nature. You know when you sleep, your eyes are closed, you don't see what is going on in the environment, you're very prone to danger, um, and as, unless a very loud noise comes, you can't wake up. So why, why are we put into that vulnerable state? So I'm, I'm sure you will appreciate that nature has puts us, uh, or uh, 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 tells us to sleep for, the, about, for about one third of the day because it serves important functions. So there are many theories, you know, that sleep is very integrated mechanism. It's not like you can't take a blood test and test your sleep. It go, it's very integrated mechanism in the brain. So many theories. One is that brain restitution. So um, during sleep, during your sleep cycles, as we go through the sleep stages, uh, there's evidence that uh, in sleep, the, the neurotoxins that get accumulated during the daytime gets cleared it, to, uh, for brain restitution. And studies have actually shown that sleep deprivation leads to accumulation of beta amyloid. And if, if, it, and if the beta amyloid uh, um, rings a bell, uh, that is uh, associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease, so dementia. Right, body restitution. You know that uh, uh, um, oh, uh, scientists have proven that there's a link between sleep curtailment or sleep deprivation and increased risk of cardiometabolic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, um, and psychological impairment. So to, for the body to revive, for the body restitution, for the metabolism to come into place, uh, for um, homeostasis mechanisms to recover um, and to restore, body restitution, sleep is necessary. And I'm going to spend a whole slide on how um, learning and memory uh, requires a good sleep because uh, we see a lot of, uh, lot of uh, children um, when we speak coming these days who are getting ready for exams, all levels or A-levels, who are studying throughout the night in the hope of getting good results. There may be, a, you may be getting ready for an exam and um, you may uh, be studying uh, in the whole night, uh, waking, uh, going to sleep around three or four o'clock in the morning, um, hoping that the more you read and more time you spend studying will actually help you to get better results. But let me tell you what, what what's the truth. So when you study, 
the, the it's, so memory consolidation. So when you re, you read something, you study something, you have to have a consolidate. You have to consolidate that for longer term use. Otherwise, there's no point. You you study something, you don't have the exam. The next minute, you have the exam several weeks or months. So you have to retain that knowledge. So you read some. So that memory consolidation is tempo. It's a temporal process, lasting minutes to months, by which uh, fragile memory traces will be strengthened and stored. So the 1996, Buzaki, after a lot of studies, gave this pathway. So first, learning-related information is transiently stored in the hippocampus, in the brain, it's transiently. And then in your next sleep, the hippocampal information is subsequently transferred to the neocortex or your new brain, to the cortical areas in, um, during the slow-wave sleep. And uh, actually, the, uh, there are thalamocortical spindles and brain ripples, which are which are in, uh, associated with memory consolidation. So there is a synchronization between these uh, sleep spindles, and there is memory going into your neocortex, and there's synapsing, strengthening, lot of interconnected neuronal network uh, network activity, which goes on to put that transient information, temporary information, into your um, uh, into your neocortex and into your long term memory. So what happens if you don't sleep enough? Don't sleep enough. So you will have to keep on keeping, keep on putting uh, your memory into your temporary compartment. So, so it's important to maintain. So it's important to advise our children. So there are lots of parents who also support the children. They come and tell my child, child is getting ready for all levels. My child is getting ready for A levels, and they are sleeping the whole night. And I keep keep up, keep awake with them. I give them food. I give them coffee. So the the parents are also unaware about the importance of sleep and, and, and uh, actually encourages this bad habit. So if you know anyone with anyone doing like that or if you yourself is doing like that, please uh, get, get a good sleep to get good results. Um, and we know that uh, if you have a bad night's sleep, if you're sleep deprived, how irritable uh, you will be the other day. So sleep deprivation is associated with psychological dis distress, dep dep depression, cognitive impairment, difficulty in making good decisions. Um, so this is also important if you're if you're a student or if or if you're uh, if you're working um, uh, on on any project, if you're working on computer, if you're work if you have to make decisions, your decision making power will be uh, impaired. So sleep in, in slow reinforces mental health, and also Juwot in 1993 after 1998, after a lot of studies, said that to be ourselves, be who you are, you need sleep. So during the wakeful period, you get a lot of influences from the outside world. To maintain your individuation, you need your sleep, and it happens in REM sleep. So it's quite interesting, and you, I suppose now we know that we need our sleep. So what are the consequences of poor sleep? Scientists have now found that there's an increased risk of cancer um, with sleep deprivation. And I also mentioned about the memory, about forgetting, judgment, difficulty in judgment, um, so maintaining sustained attention. Sleep deprivation also leads to a lower pain threshold. You become a very painful person. You have, your, you, you, you have all sorts of angry pati rubdava when you don't have enough sleep. Uh, then um, it, it increases the likelihood of uh, poor mental health. It's associated with early mortality. So if you have to, if you want to live a long life, you also have to sleep well. And we also know that people who have sleep deprivation or, and who are sleepy uh, because, uh, as a result of that um, are prone to accidents. Uh, and we know that a lot of road traffic accidents are after the driver has fallen asleep. So it's important to get your sleep. Right, moving on to dreams. People are very interested to know what is dreams and what goes on in dreams. And it's very, uh, well, it's, it's not easy uh, to uh, uh, study dreams, but people have been trying to figure out uh, what is that, what's the actual meaning of dreams. So dream is actually a collection of mental activity. So to study dreams, you actually have to find out first where the mind is, because it, it's a recollection of the mental activity which has gone on uh, during sleep. It happens in REM sleep. And um, when the dreams are of negative quality, you get nightmares, night terrors. Um, so um, occasionally nightmares and night terrors are all right. They are not pathological. But if it happens very frequently, they affect day-to-day -day life, then they become disorders. Um, so dreams are, um, so what exactly is the purpose of dream is still an unanswered question. Um, 
the one theory is that uh, dreams uh, uh, is a is a is a situation where where the brain gives you lots of brain puts you through a lot of challenging situations uh, to um, so that you uh, you uh, it, it kind of put you lots of tests so that you are uh, uh, adapted to face uh, different different situations. Um, that's just that's some, that's one theory. And we know that in dreams, dreams improve our creativity. Um, one, one, um, so Paul McCartney has some um, uh, nice songs which uh, he has dreamt, uh, has, which has come up because of dreams. Um, uh, the famous uh, book by uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, if you have read it, is, is a story that, has, that he has dreamt. So there are lots of evidence in the literature where actually people have dreamt paintings, stories, um, so, uh, so dreams are helpful. Right, so now we have gone through how, what, about sleep. We know what are the stages of sleep and uh, we know the importance of sleep, what will happen if we don't sleep right. So how do we sleep right? So uh, to sleep right, you have to maintain a regular routine. It is important to maintain a regular bedtime and a regular wake up time. So if now, uh, now, if you have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning for work, and you know that your sleep requirement is about seven hours, then you can, you know what time you should go to bed. So you have to have a set bedtime, a set wake up time. And before you go to bed, there are several things that you have to be uh, vigilant or careful about. So you have to avoid stimulants like caffeine at least five hours before sleep. So caffeine includes coffee, tea, chocolates, fizzy drinks, any stimulants. And the nicotine is a very um, powerful stimulant. So smoking is detrimental to sleep and uh, it, it, it should be avoided altogether. But if it's someone who's trying to cut down nicotine, the last cigarette smoking should be at least five hours before the sleep. It is that powerful uh, to keep you awake and to disrupt your sleep. Avoid alcohol at about uh, a few hours before bedtime because even though alcohol is known to put to sleep, it is also known to cause very fragmented sleep in the night. Then exercise timing. The best time to exercise is in the morning, after, in the first few hours after waking up. And if you want to exercise in the evening, still you have to keep about five hours of gap between the sleep and exercise because uh, even though you may think it will make you tired, it actually causes excitement and increased uh, uh, stress hormones uh, that will um, uh, impair a good night's sleep. Timing of dinner. You should uh, have your dinner at least two hours before uh, your bedtime. So if, if your bedtime uh, is at 11 p.m., start winding down at 10, 10 p.m. That is, you take a, a wash, have time for self-grooming, brush your teeth, put your pajamas. So you, you have to stop all other activities. And it is especially important to stop, keep, stop your devices. I'm not telling that you have to stop devices altogether, but you have to keep your phone, your iPad, your computer away one hour before your bedtime. So if your bedtime is at 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you have to put those things away. That is because the, the stimulating light will um, uh, will cause, uh, uh, so it will inhibit the hormones that put you to sleep. Um, so so uh, there is a question about um, blocking the screen and everything, but even if blocking the screening will have some effect, but it will not have the, uh, the total effect. So it will still have some light giving coming to your eyes and the light reaches the retina behind the eye and the retinohypothalamic tract, retina to the hypothalamus, retinal hypothalamic tract um, will give the input about the light information and start uh, emitting hormones of wakefulness and it will diminish sleep hormones so therefore it is important to stop devices at least one hour so just one hour i'm sure you can do it and then uh so you talk about routine wake up time and if you don't fall asleep uh in bed or, or don't spend too much time just lying there in bed the bed the brain has to know the association between the bed and sleeping and just don't spend hours and hours in bed trying to fall asleep to see how to come out um, and then the sun, it's timing of sun exposure. Sun is the main circadian rhythm regulator in our body. It's called, it's the, the technical term is, it's a zy, it's a zy, it's a zy, um, So the, the sun 
um, so if I put it in this way, the sun emits more than, uh, so if you take a, let, let's put it this way, so a room light will emit about 10,000 lux, a very bright room light, 10,000 lux, lux is the unit measurement. But when it comes to the sunlight, it's more than 100,000 luxes. So you can't compare a room light to uh, to the sun, the excessive light that it emits. So this, so you have to get exposed to the sunlight to have a good night's sleep uh, in the night. In the, so you have to get exposed sunlight in the morning. It's the best time is the first three hours of the morning so that you have, you go to sleep, you fall asleep at the right time and you have a good night's sleep. So I have mentioned this term CBT min here. Uh, that is the core body temperature. You, you, can, you have to, so your body temperature, uh, so if you check your body temperature now, you know uh, that it is at certain level. And this core body temperature goes down in the night when you sleep and it reaches a minimum about two hours before your natural wake up time. So if you naturally wake up about six hours, your core body temperature minimum is at four hours. And the best time to get a time expo a sun exposure for a good night's sleep is in the first three hours after your CBT min. So uh, that will be between four and seven for a person who wakes up at six o'clock. So you can work out what is best for you. And during the daytime, you, it's best to avoid napping and um, uh, if you really want a nap, uh, please make sure that it is not more than one hour and avoid sleeping after 3 p.m. So these are the uh, steps of how do we sleep right. They are also called sleep hygiene measures. So now you can design your new sleep schedule. So you can um, uh, you can uh, put you can take a piece of paper and put down your wake up time. Then you can calculate. Then you can. Uh, calculate how, what you, uh, your bedtime should be, what should be your winding down time, what, why, when should you put your devices down, when should you have your meals, your exercise, um, and what, when should you, your last cup of caffeinated drink be. And this should be for the seven days of the week. So I hope you're still with me and not uh, falling asleep. Um, it's because now we are going to move, uh, move on to the sleep disorder. So what goes wrong in sleep? Um, so there, there are several types of sleep disorders. Actually, there is a spectrum of sleep disorders. And the ICSD-3, International Classification of Sleep Disorders, has uh, basically categorized them into five groups. You have the insomnia group of disorders. You can't fall asleep. Then you have the sleep-related breathing disorders uh, that you may have heard about obstructive sleep apnea, obesity hyperventilation. Then you have the group of central disorders of hypo, hypersomnolence, always falling asleep. That girl you may remember, for example, narcolepsy, diabetic hypersomnolence, medical disorders with hypersomnolence. Then you have the parasomnias, the night terrors, the nightmares, the acting out dreams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you have the sleep-related movement disorders, flailing your legs or periodically movement with sleep. So the insomnia is the commonest sleep disorder. What happens is the patient has difficulty in initiation of sleep, has difficulty in maintaining sleep, staying asleep, despite having good circumstances to sleep, despite having a nice, quiet, um, dark room to sleep, the patient is not falling asleep. So I'm sure all of us have experienced episodes of insomnia in our life because it is very closely linked to our mental state. So if you're getting ready for an exam, if you have a job interview, if you're, uh, if you have, if you're going through a stressful period in your life, uh, you're worried about your, any of your family or friends, even changing house, even, cha even if one of your workmates uh, change in, in, uh, at your workplace, so any small thing is enough to trigger you, um, trigger your mental activity and put, put you into a transient uh, um, or short-term insomnia. But of course, uh, after a few days, it goes off and you go back to sleeping normally. But if it lasts more than three months, then you go into a chronic insomnia disorder. And some people are born with uh, uh, in chronic insomnia disorder. They are all they, are, they they haven't been able to sleep properly since their childhood, and some people develop it after a certain trigger. Uh, it can be even an illness, um, and. Uh, 
uh, there are several types of uh, insomnia, psychophysiological insomnia. You can sleep well in your bedroom, but the moment you go on holiday and you sleep in a hotel, you don't fall asleep. Or you go and sleep in your friend's house or you go to hospital, you don't. So psychophysiological insomnia or the other way around. You never can fall asleep in your own bedroom, but you go on holiday and you fall asleep. So there are different types. And then there's a sleep state misperception. Patients come and tell you, I don't sleep a wink in the night. I haven't slept a moment in my sleep. But when you do a EEG, the patient has been having good sleep cycle. So there's a there's just a pathological state, sleep state misperception. Or it can be just very bad sleep hygiene. Or it may be the patient thinks he has insomnia, but it actually is a short sleep, but the patient needs about five. The, it's, then it's not a patient, he may need about five, six hours of sleep. There are so when it comes to management, I'll just touch. So if you have patients coming and telling you that you can't fall asleep, there are a few things that you will, that, that you can tell them uh, to do and not to do. I will start with not to do because there are a lot of things that the people with insomnia do to try to make them fall asleep. They sometimes go to bed earlier thinking that if they lie in the bed, they will fall asleep and that will help them. Or they wake up in the morning and think they haven't slept at all in the night and they will spend some more hours in the bed thinking that it is that it will help them. They should not do that. Other thing is they think that they have, a, they, they have not slept in the night, so they sleep in the daytime. That will again make their sleep erratic. And, so, and they think they haven't had a good rest in the night, so my body is not uh, rested enough. They stop any activity and they stop going out and they avoid activity. Or sometimes they... Uh, in their bed, they uh, they, uh, they stay uh, in, when they wake in the night and for long periods they just lie in the bed. Uh, and I will tell you the twenty minute rule in the next slide. Or they will use start using iPads and devices. Sometimes they allow themselves to fall asleep on the chairs and sofas, thinking that they don't fall asleep in the bed. They take they may take alcohol as sedatives. Sometimes it can be the caffeine and the smoking that is not putting them to sleep. Then there is anxiety and worry about sleep. People who don't fall asleep constantly keep on thinking, I'm not falling asleep, something will happen to me. So that this constant worry about it uh, um, increases the stress hormone level and then uh, who takes you away from sleep. So that's something that you should not sleep. One, one, one important thing or the first thing I tell patients with insomnia is stop worrying about sleep, forget about sleep. Then how so the things that they can do uh, so as 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 medical personnel you can find out what is actually triggering it and uh, address it with the patient and and if it is a transient factor you can advise in that way but if you think there are psychi psychological or psychiatric triggers you have to refer them for mental health help. Uh, so when people ask about sedative drugs, when can we give sedative drugs for uh, patients with insomnia? And mind you, there is no place for long-term sedative drugs in, um, in insomnia. Uh, if they have acute insomnia and they have total, they have total sleep deprivation in an acute stage, um, and you feel that they are very exhausted, then, then you can give for a maximum period of two to three weeks um, uh, of a, a short-acting sedative drug, but not for long-term use. And um, if some people take melatonin uh, in a long-term uh, basis, and that is not proven for insomnia, and you will not be able to come out of insomnia when you take drugs in long-term. And also the thing important importance with melatonin is that if you get the timing of the melatonin wrong, it can actually worsen your sleep cycle. And I will touch on that in a little while. Uh, advise patients on sleep hygiene. You can uh, ask them to maintain a sleep diary to calculate their sleep efficiency and to work out a plan. And the first time and important management step uh, in um, insomnia is cognitive behavioral therapy. So once you have done the basics with your patients and if the patient is still having insomnia, refer them for a sleep specialist or someone who's trained in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And the 20 minute rule is that if you're in bed lying down and if you feel you haven't slept for a good 20 to 30 minutes, come out of bed. Don't just stay there lying down. Come out of bed, go to another room or go to uh, go sit on a chair, do some light reading. Don't take your iPad or phone again to go through your emails just to keep you up, wake up more. So you just have to uh, do some light reading, some crosswords or something. And when you're tired, go back to bed. And if you if you fall asleep and you wake up and happens again, you have to keep on doing that. That is very important. That is to train the body, uh, train the brain that the bed is for sleep and for nothing else. 
um, then we move on to sleep related breathing disorders so i will just run through the sleep disorders for you to get an overall idea and i will not be not going into detail because it will be uh, another few hours actually so uh, so sleep related breathing disorder you may have heard about obstructive sleep apnea patients who have loud snoring and sleep uh, fragmented sleep in the night and somnolence during the day uh, then there is central sleep apnea which is another sleep type of sleep apnea that you should be aware about patients have uh, fragmented sleep some snoring and daytime sleepiness um, commonly associated with heart failure or arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and um, most of the time you find that the patients uh, you attribute the patient's sleepiness or the fatigue to the medication or the disease but at the central sleep apnea if you evaluate and you find out central sleep apnea is actually a treatable cause so obstructive sleep apnea, it's associated with snoring, but not all snorers are sleep apnea. There can be primary snoring, just primary snoring without any sleep apnea. To diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, you have to look for the clinical features of sleepiness, uh, fragmented sleep, non-restorative sleep, um, and the patient wakes up in the night with breath holding, gasping, very fragmented sleep. And uh, patient's partner, a bed partner notices uh, and reports apneic episodes or breath holding episodes, stopping breathing in the night. And then you have to do a, a sleep study for diagnosis. So uh, uh, we'll look, talk about the risk factors for sleep apnea because that was one of the questions that I remember uh, that was sent uh, to um, in, in the chat, in the chat, uh, the question list. So uh, obstructive sleep apnea, there are non-modifiable risk factors. So if you're a male, you're at risk. When you start aging, you're at risk. And uh, certain, for certain craniofacial abnormalities, um, then you're at risk, so you can't change your facial contour you're born with it and then if you have a narrow throat then you even if you even there are some people who have normal bmi but still can have obstructive sleep apnea uh, so why the gender because uh, there is a difference in the pharyngeal collapsibility and the hormones uh, in the in the male gene like testosterone um, play uh, play a, a part in the different as a cause for the difference uh, in the gender as a risk factor for sleep apnea so uh, um, then there are some families which have uh, uh, sleep apnea, and I think it's mainly related to the craniofacial abnormalities. Then the modifiable risk factors, your weight. If you're overweight, uh, if you're obese, then that contributes to uh, sleep apnea. And that is, so some people who are started on CPAP machines as a treatment actually can come off their CPAP pressures if, you, if they lose weight and they maintain, uh, maintain their BMI. Uh, alcohol, benzodiazepines, uh, nicotine or smoking, um, and then other conditions like heart failure, acromegaly, hypothyroidism, which we have to look for, uh, can also um, uh, cause, uh, lead to sleep apnea. So I talked, I, I gave you an insight into central sleep apnea. Uh, so patients with heart failure, arrhythmias, with sleepiness, um, think whether it can be central sleep apnea. <clears throat> Then you have the group of sleep-related hypoventilation disorders. And one of the questions was, what is the difference between obstructive sleep apnea and obesity hypoventilation syndrome? Is it two things or is it one thing? So obstructive sleep apnea is where you have your airways get collapsed uh, during sleep. Your airway is obstructed or the flow is reduced. The oxygen level in the body dips down and the brain has to constantly wake you up to take a breath. So you have apneic episodes, you have total reduction of your air flow, or there's a total uh, stopping of the air flow or a reduction in air flow. So you take a breath and you're fine, and that is obstructive sleep. In obesity hypoventilation syndrome, it, it is associated with obstructive sleep apnea, but what goes on in obesity hypoventilation syndrome is, again, there's an obese person, and there is a problem in maintaining ventilation that is, there is accumulation of carbon dioxide. There's a problem in washing out carbon dioxide. So they're very sleepy in the morning. They have morning headaches. And if you do a morning arterial blood gas, you notice that the carbon dioxide has um, accumulated. So to differentiate the two, so you do a... Um, uh, sleep study, you have obstructive sleep apnea separately. I will show you uh, one of the sleep studies later on. And in obesity hyperventilation, you have carb car CO2 narcosis, carbon dioxide going off in the night, and which, which spills over to the morning as well. 
there are several types of hypoventilation disorders and the basics of management of sleep apnea because it's it's commonly encountered especially in this covid pandemic people have been staying at home in lockdown the gyms are closed exercise planning is closed and you don't have to go to work or to school and what you do you all uh, whatever biscuit or the uh, the cakes or the the oily food that is around you keep on munching and you have uh, and and people have gained weight so um, uh, so they come and tell you you after covid i'm more breathless and when you actually question it it's more i'm um, after covid i'm more tired i'm more fatigued than they attributed to covid but you actually find out their weight has increased and they have developed sleep apnea so address modifiable risk factors now you know and the first line of management in obstructive sleep apnea is cpap um, and there is a place for ENT surgery as well, uh, depending on where the sleep study, where, where the obstruction is. And for that, you have to refer, refer for ENT and there's a specific test called uh, DICE or drug-induced sleep endoscopy. But, and they have, but the thing is with sleep apnea, the laryngeal airway collapses in several places. And if you correct one place, you may still have collapse in the other places. It's important to improve sleep hygiene as well. Then uh, central disorders of hypersomnia are normally stigate, but common, you may have heard about narcolepsy, uh, where the, there's this, uh, I talked about the, the, the case three, where the girl always falls asleep. And cat narcolepsy can be, as, there's a type which is associated with cataplexy, where you lose the body tone and you collapse. Uh, so narcolepsy is, well, all the child is always sleepy. And if some parent comes to you and says, my child is always sleepy, my child is lazy, my child is not getting up in the morning. Yes, you have to look whether there's anemia, there's nutritional problem, there's psychological problem, there's any bullying going on. All that has to be assessed. But also you have to see whether it is a sleep disorder. Is there something pathological going on in the sleep? Um, it is important to be aware because most of the time these children are cornered and they are because they don't receive the proper diagnosis and nobody has found out what is wrong with them. They are always sleepy. And they, then they lose out on their education, then they lose out on jobs. And uh, finally, when they reach about 30, 40, someone will pick them up and get diagnosed. And it's too late. They don't have any qualification to do any jobs, even if you treat them. Fine, you have the circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders, the next one. Okay, the next group of disorders. Um, so I'll be touching again uh, without going into detail. Um, so I, I, you know that there's a circadian rhythm. You have a body internal body clock. It wakes you up in the morning. It puts you to sleep in the night. Your, your a normal uh, standard circadian uh, rhythm is at 24.2 hours in a human. But what if your circadian rhythm is uh, more or less than this. So then what will happen? There are people with delayed, a delayed cycle. Some people um, wake up, uh, go to sleep around three or four in the morning. And then from when they, that is, they fall asleep only in that time, only at that time. And however much they maintain good sleep hygiene, however much they try to uh, sleep early, they can't. They fall, they feel sleepy only around that time. And then they have a good seven to eight hours of sleep and they wake up and they maintain a good activity level. So their whole sleep cycle has gone delayed. Or there's the other group of patients, they are, they are, this is pathologic, they, these, these are pathologies, where it is pulled forward. You fall asleep early and you wake up very early. So, uh, but mind you, there is, it, it, this can be iatrogenic. If someone who is working uh, on a cross, uh, uh, country, not cross country, um, uh, working um, with a country which, which is on a different time zone, then they will be iatrogenically pushing themselves into this uh, disorder. But um, uh, so the, this, in the long term, it can have uh, problems in maintaining uh, a proper, um, proper, uh, uh, you know, if you go on doing it for a long time, you will not get the benefits of a good sleep unless it is managed properly. So if you know someone, um, it's best to give them sleep hygiene activities and also and maybe refer them for proper advice on how to handle uh, these disorders. Um, so there is irregular sleep wake rhythm disorder, your sleep pattern is all over. Some people come and tell that however much you try, you're sleeping in bouts of three to four hours within 24 hours, they're very irregular. You especially sleep, see it in blind people who don't have a good um, uh, uh, retinal hypothalamic input. And then there's the jet lag disorder, which I will touch on. Then you have the parasomnia, sleepwalking, sleep terror, sleep eating, then REM, REM behavior disorder, which is acting out dreams. Uh, then you have this isolated sleep paralysis. Patient is awake, but can't move. 
uh, so isolated sleep paralysis nightmare disorder so there are a lot of uh, parasomnias uh, which cause distress disrupted sleep and date, uh, distress in the daytime day day activities but now there are normal things happening as well which you may have experienced like hypnic jerks when you're fall, falling asleep you suddenly have a sudden jerky moment your knee or your foot will go uh, like in a jerk so uh, like in like a myoclonus as, as you're drifting into sleep those are normal or sudden sometimes you will have a sudden falling sensation or sudden swoosh loud noise as you're going into your drifting into sleep these are normal don't worry about them but if you have any other things you can uh, you have to start worrying and then sleep related movement disorders the, the big partner says the moment my husband or wife falls asleep their legs start going everywhere and it causes sleep disruption so when you so there is a whole spectrum of sleep disorders you will understand um of course when there is one third of life percent spent in sleep and then there has to be a lot of sleep disorders um then then you have to refer them for evaluation uh, so there are lots of, there are several types of sleep studies available and respiratory polygraphy or the apnea link is one that is commonly available here in uh, in sleep in, in uh, sleep clinics or related uh, attached to respiratory clinics mainly in the tertiary centers around the country you have the service available you can refer if you're suspecting any patient and you've done the basic management and you still need the uh, evaluation you can refer them for uh, refer them to the uh, sleep clinic uh, the respiratory clinic uh, so uh, and this is uh, this is about obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. What you get in these sleep studies, uh, so you can see there are spells of breathing and stopping breathing, sleeping, stopping breathing, and these are the chest and abdominal movements that is recorded during the obstructive sleep apnea episodes. So the breathing is stopped, but the chest and abdomen are trying to move. That is obstructive sleep apnea. And when it comes to central sleep apnea, you can see there's breathing, no breathing, breathing, no breathing, but the chest and abdominal movements don't move as well. That is central sleep apnea. So I just put them because I, I'm sure there are people who are getting ready for exams. And nowadays, sleep medicine also is an area that is question on. Then you have level one sleep study where you check the EEG, EOG, EMG, all parameters are checked in detail, heart rate, uh, nasal pressure, nasal flow, etc a sleep diary is important to maintain uh, and identify the sleep pattern in the patient in the evaluation of insomnia or circadian rhythm disorder it's maintained over 14 days and we have sleep diaries available in our respiratory clinic if anyone wants to have a look uh, to have feel one for themselves and then I wanted, uh, so people come with lots of Fitbits, isn't it? So people come with lots of various types of watches and uh, various types of devices saying, Dr. Mike, uh, I haven't had REM sleep. I haven't had this. So we may not have heard about REM sleep, but they come and tell us their REM sleep is like, their non-REM sleep is like this. They haven't been in deep sleep. I have slept only this much. So these are not medical grade devices and we don't rely or don't give diagnosis based on these uh, devices. There are medical grade devices called actigraphy devices, which are used. Um, not in, in our, not here, but in other countries. Um, but they get a crude, they give a crude value, uh, uh, overall idea about the sleep quality. And if your sleep is fine, then you can get an idea. But if your sleep is not right, if it is pathological, then it's very difficult to base a diagnosis on these. Uh, and, and and actually to say whether you have got non-REM sleep or REM sleep and amount, you have to do an EEG. Uh, so uh, salivary melatonin is also uh, um, checked in um, checked uh, uh, in other countries to uh, identify rhythm disorders. Uh, so when it comes to melatonin, as I said before, the melatonin starts secreting in dusk when there is not enough light, and then when the sun goes down, the melatonin starts secreting and it is secreted by the pineal gland. It usually starts secreting about two hours before your habitual sleep time. And if you want, so if you're somebody who have, who is sleeping very late in the night and if you want to shift it early, then you have to uh, get exposed to light in the first three hours after your core body temperature minimum. I told you that's about two, three hours before your habitual wake up time. And if you want, if it is someone who, who you want to face delay, that is if you want to, sleep, if you want to push the um, uh, sleep time sleep time further back, then you have to have some exposure before CBT. 
and I told you about the um, uh, the sun sun exposure and how strong it is. And when it comes to melatonin, prescribing melatonin, it has to be given in the correct time uh, to get a proper circadian shift. Otherwise, it will just affect your sleep rhythm, and you and and uh, so the so if you want to give um, uh, when you want to give melatonin, you have to first calculate what is the time of the patient's CBT mean. From the CBT mean, you calculate uh, what the that is dependent on your and their habitual wake up time. Can you calculate their DLMO, the dim light melatonin onset time, which I said is about. Uh, so if you, the, the actual the calculation is about seven hours before uh, CBT mean. So the uh, for for DLMO, um, uh, so if you want to give someone to for to, um, to put them to sleep, and especially in the jet lag disorder, you start with a very small dose of 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams two to three hours before their DLMO. Because if you have accidentally given the melatonin at a time um, within three to four hours of before their CBT min, then actually it causes a real disruption to their sleep, and patients will suffer. Uh, you may have heard about the stop bang and their poor sleepiness score that can be done to evaluate sleep uh, uh, sleepiness and then you can uh, refer patients for sleep studies. Uh, and because of the limited time, I will quickly give you a word about jet lag because I think that is something uh, people are flying all around these days. Mm -hmm. Trying to so, um, what is what do you think? Is it easier to travel to UK from Sri Lanka or from Sri Lanka to UK? And this is regarding to sleep. I'm not. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure you would give me an answer in the current economic state. But uh, well, what, what do you think with regards to um, sleep? So actually, uh, eastward travel is most difficult. Eastward travel because when I mean, you think of the timing, um, the if you if you now if it is uh, when it is uh, uh, ten a.m. Uh, in UK, um, so it, it, we've already gone four and a half hours advanced uh, in in Sri Lanka. So ten a.m. in UK will be about two thirty p.m. here. So when so when someone let's let's take an example. The easiest way to take an example. So I'm traveling from UK to Sri Lanka. So at the moment, the time difference is four and a half hours. But to uh, uh, but for ease of calculation, let's take it as six hours. So first, so to manage. So let's say you're traveling for a conference. You have invited a speaker to come from UK to give a talk on Sri in Sri Lanka. Of course, you can't entertain the pair person for one whole week. So you he comes today, and you would you want the person to give a uh, speak speech or and come to a conference soon, attend the conference soon. So first, you have to calculate the CBT mean. What is the CBT mean? You know that already. If you if you have calculated CBT mean as 4 a.m. in UK, that time corresponds to 10 a.m. in the new time zone. So we have to get the person to sleep earlier or face advance because that in Sri Lanka, we are four and a half hours advance. Now, in this case, six, you take it as six hours advance. So we ask the patient not to get light exposure before their CBT mean. So if they get light exposure before 10 a.m., then they will actually push their sleep away further. What you want to do is pull it. So then you have to advise the patient to have adequate light exposure in the first three hours after their CBT mean. Okay. Uh, so it's so you have to do this small calculation and give them the proper advice. So one, if something goes wrong, then you will be actually phase delaying when you have to do phase advance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, and and then when, and and in this way and then you know uh, about the melatonin dosing. I told you that when if you are prescribing melatonin for jet lag, you have to give the um, uh, melatonin at very small dose before their dim light DLMO. If you want to have a um, uh, uh, quick uh, adjustment to the time zone difference. Then treatment of, so if, if, if there's uh, any query, if someone is flying from home or flying from uh, from, from some other country to uh, here or planning to fly and wants to attend a conference and wants to uh, have the, this, this thing calculated, I'm sure I'll, uh, I'm fine to uh, help you or if you put in this chat. Uh, treatment of jet lag, uh, there are the certain behavioral things. Uh, you can uh, wear eye shades when you should be sleeping. That is in the flight, maintain a good uh, hydration. Um, and also they advise eat on the destination time, but of course it's uh, practically you can't do, you can't, you have, you have to go by what um, they uh, uh, 
Uh, so this, this I will skip in the interest of time because I want to uh, mention this is one slide on shift work because all of us healthcare workers do shift work. Um, and uh, how, and then we have our families to juggle with. So you do night work or you do a sort of shift that is a normal day, long day, uh, night shift. And, uh, we, and when you go on doing that, uh, it will start affecting your day-to-day -day quality. It will start having detrimental effect uh, on you. So you have to know how to handle it. So if you're going for a night shift, um, let's say it starts at 8 p.m., bright light at the start of the shift. So you have bright light in the first three to six hours. So when, and then you come home, uh, let's say you're leaving your hospital around 7 to 8 a.m., avoid bright. So you have bright light in Sri Lanka and, and, and you avoid bright light in the earlier. So if possibly you can wear your sunglasses. If you're taking, uh, some, somebody else is driving, if you're taking public transport, wear sunglasses, wear, uh, you know, have your windows closed. Uh, try to avoid bright light as much as possible on your way back home. Then as when you get home, make sure that your curtains are already closed. You can close them before you go to work so your curtains are closed when you come back. So you have to maintain the dark sleep environment, go home, have have a meal. So you know that we usually advise people to take uh, two, a meal two hours before sleep in a routine sleep. But in here, you have to have a small meal because otherwise you'll be waking up hungry. So you have your meal and then you go to bed as soon as possible. And then if you, uh, you, you can't, I mean, I know, I mean, of course, we know from experience, you can't sleep about seven hours when you come back after a night shift. So you get about three, four hours of sleep and if possible, schedule another nap before you go for your shift. Right, uh, so two hour nap in the late afternoon before the shift is effective, and you when you go for the shift in the beginning of the shift, you can take coffee, uh, to uh, coffee, tea, chocolates, no place for melatonin. Okay, so there were some MCQs uh, that uh, was uh, handed over. Uh, I'll quickly go through the yes. yes. Um, so how many hours does a healthy young man, so I've touched this, you know this already, how many hours should you sleep? Uh, you know that it's not, I mean, this is a study, st population study, which will tell you 79 hours of sleep, and it's up to you to find out, uh, calculate how many hours of sleep you need. So what is the common sleep disorder? You know that it is insomnia. Um, one of the following is not a risk factor for sleep apnea. Male gender is, obesity is, smoking is, testosterone is, exercise is not, it's actually good. One of the following does not belong to good sleep hygiene practices. Using social media up to 15 minutes before sleep, you know that you have to keep it away one hour before. Brushing teeth before sleep, yes, you should be doing that. Dim the lights close to bedtime, yes, you should do. Avoid smoking, yes. Keep a routine bedtime, yes. So number one is the wrong answer. What advice will you give a teenage child who stays up all night working on the computer? It is okay to work all night and sleep about three to four hours in the daytime? No, no. Phone or laptop can be used until they fall asleep in the night? No. Stop device, use at, use at least one hour before sleep and maintain a routine bedtime? Correct. Studying for about 20 hours a day and sleeping three to four hours will enhance the exam results? Please let me know if you come across such a person. Gaming in the night is a good way to relieve stress before exam? No, again. <laughs> 20-year-old man goes to sleep at 4 o'clock in the morning. He does not sleep during and he finds it difficult to wake up before that. So, uh, so this is the delayed sleep case disorder that I was, uh, that we just discussed before. I'm sure you can uh, get that. A 45-year-old banker comes to see the doctor and the wife says that the husband is heavily uh, snoring heavily, stops breathing in the night, and he's having a high BMI. So straightforward obstructive sleep apnea. So... Um, if you have any queries uh, or you want to enhance your knowledge further or and or if you want to calculate the number of hours you will have to sleep or if you want to do the stop bang or if you're sleeping, let's go and find out whether you are sleeping, uh, you can use this website. It is maintained by the uh, Ceylon College of Pulmonologists. Uh, it was recently on sleepbetter.lk. There's uh, information in English and Sinhala and Tamil also with uh, YouTube uh, videos that you can use in your patients. Right. So time to wake up. Thank you. Uh, if, you, if you have questions, you can ask. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Madam. Uh, that was a very interesting and informative lecture. Uh, we had a few questions uh, from our participants which were, which were already addressed during the lecture. 
other than that there were a few uh, questions that were coming on uh, medications uh, so our participants want to know what are the best group of drugs for short term sleep management or whether it's recommended mm. so uh, when it comes to medication uh, I, i suppose you're referring to insomnia i think that is the insomnia is a very challenging disorder to treat and you have to tell the patient the first thing you have to tell the patient is that insomnia is has been going on for ages in your life and don't expect a quick 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 fix overnight there it there is no pill to swallow the to correct it so it, uh, it is mainly uh, you have to emphasize on the sleep basic sleep hygiene measures and if not the first line and the most effective treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy but if you think your patient is going through an acute stress period and has acute insomnia uh, to uh, go over the um, uh, first only for the first 2 to 3 weeks you can give a, a short acting benzodiazepine only for the uh, first 2 to 3 weeks and not longer than that uh, of course in in uh, in uh, other countries i have not seen it available here you use the z group of drugs as opiclone the zolpidems um, if, if, if that is available uh, we can prescribe that for maximum 2 3 weeks and not for long term because it will just go on properly the disease so you have to um, always uh, try to get the diagnosis with a sleep diary uh, and uh, it's essential that they they start they worry there are a lot of correctable causes and i have come across patients who actually improve without medication when you correct but my, there are is a group of patients who's, who are very resistant to treatment so it's important to avoid long term prescription i hope it helps uh, another question this is also medication related madam they want to know Uh, whether there is a recommendation for benzodiazepines for the elderly who have poor sleep right uh, so um the sleep in elderly is a very uh, very uh, unaddressed area i think uh, not only the patient the lot of the disruption to the patient's family members is there so uh, when, uh, when actually you look at them they want to look at what is going on in the elderly people they are always in a very dark environment they stay in their room they don't come out they do they have their curtains closed they don't uh, get adequate exposure to sunlight so then what happens is they have very, they, they always fall asleep because they are bored they don't have work to go they don't have children to look after so uh, now in this in our intense lifestyle in our in our we are going you now all of us are in the in our um, um, young age or middle age and we are we have a lot of things to do and we don't want to sleep even if we are very sleepy but when you are after retirement and you don't have responsibilities what else you do you watch the tv and you fall asleep so then the inactivity leads to chunks of daytime sleep and when they fall asleep in the daytime do you think they will be able to sleep in the night so if you go and give that patient then so that's in the night then you will just aggravate the problem because it so then so that's it is apart from being a respiratory depressant it will also cause balance impairment they can lead to falls they have to so they you know that they have increased nutrition in the night so they they have balance in impairment precision movement impairment so first try to identify what is going wrong it may be a pathological condition it can be sleep apnea it can be central sleep apnea it can be a correctable cause um, so first explore take a good history find out with go what is going wrong and uh, been routine benzodiazepine prescription is not at all encouraged uh, in uh, in uh, uh, sleep pain in dement in in uh, patients in people with uh, in elderly patients and in dementia patients also we don't encourage because uh, not even melatonin because it can uh, cause a lot of um, uh, the side effects and a lot of problems in in these patient groups so it's mainly behavioral and if at all as i said short course to go through a uh, go through a very acute period of time most of the time when people come with this problem you have uh, you find out that they are they're just having curtains drawn and staying inside the dark living room watching their tv without going out and that is the place that you have to just draw the curtain open the curtains and get the sunrise uh, get get the sun working on your circadian pattern that itself will do the trick next question madam uh, social question can sleep deprivation cause obesity mm. good question so uh, uh, sleep so sleep deprivation uh, causes a lot of changes in your hormones so uh, 
so so studies have found that in sleep so i'll i'll, I'll answer that question very directly because there's an interest of mine uh, sleep deprivation uh, studies have found that there is increased leptin increased uh, ghrelin and decreased leptin uh, so ghrelin is the or exogenic hormone that is it makes wheat and uh, leptin is the anorexogenic hormone that says that you're if that's enough so when you have sleep deprivation uh, you tend to eat more and when you tend to eat more that you put on weight um, so this is what studies have found out so far um, so uh, so you know it even so it's there's a so there's a kind of explanation as i said and also when you're awake and you're at home you and you want to push your sleep especially if you're doing something and you want to fight your sleep you keep on munching something so hormone plus your nitrogen behavioral habits there are a few more questions on medications madam uh, the audience want to know the uh, place of uh, amitriptyline in managing insomnia or also the place of using antidepressants in treatment of insomnia when patients are not even diagnosed with depression Right. So uh, again, uh, yes, amitriptyline is uh, is uh, is used uh, um, as uh, in in small doses to give them some rest, um, and it has been I have seen it been commonly used. Again, I have to say uh, over and over again that there is no place for long term management. You can use it for a short time, but most of the time, insomnia has a very close relationship with the uh, psychological. Or mental ill health, even subtle. So uh, it's important to explore that and get uh, mental health help as well. There's something going on in their mind uh, which they need help for. Um, so it's good to, good to evaluate and get. So uh, there, there's no benefit, there's no proven uh, place for long term antidepressants for insomnia per se. Um, you can uh, use for the, what is prescribed is for two to three weeks. We have multiple queries on uh, the participants wanting to know what is the adequate amount of uh, sleep you need prior to an exam or how can you manage your sleep when you are preparing for an exam? What is the limited minimum amount of sleep that is needed? Excellent. So I'm, I'm sure all of us, uh, all of us, uh, that's so important in, uh, in our chosen profession, isn't it? We have exams all over life. Um, so uh, first find out how many hours of sleep you need. So let's say you need seven hours of sleep. And the fact is, for memory consolidation, you just have to give your body the seven hours of sleep. So again, it comes to well planning and cutting down on the time uh, in the rest of that how many hours you have left? You have 14 hours of sleep. Oh, no, you have uh, more than that. You have 17 hours left. So you just have to maximize on that 17 hours of sleep. And whatever you have put into your transient or the temporary brain, you have to go and sleep that seven hours to put them into uh, your uh, long term use. Sorry about that, but that's that. <laughs> um, one more question, Madam. Uh, what is your advice regarding managing sleep deprivation during pregnancy? Mm. So, uh, sleep and women's health is, is a separate. Uh, long topic in itself. Mm -hmm. So not only pregnancy, um, menarche, mm -hmm. menstruation, menopause, uh, there are a lot of hormonal fluctuations uh, during that time. So uh, the question is uh, the sleep deprivation. In, so again, when it comes to pregnancy, there are there is your P1, P2, and P3, and post delivery. So uh, so so it's it's very uh, you can't just uh, give cut and dry numbers to that. The, the question is sleep, how it affects. Uh, yes. um, so you need, um, uh, so in P, in, if you take P1, uh, you will have uh, difficulty in waking up in the morning. It varies again, a lot of individ individual variability with morning sickness, but it is well known that you need to rest. But there is no recommendation to say that you need to sleep more. It's just that uh, the, the, it doesn't say that uh, someone who is ordinarily sleeping seven hours need to sleep 10 hours or even eight hours. There's, you just need to sleep your normal sleep hours. And uh, so your sleep, so as the pregnancy grows, your sleep may be disrupted with gastritis uh, or um, breathlessness. And then you have to address those that come in. Uh, and 
uh, still maintain proper sleep hygiene. To, uh, you know that some people spend long hours in bed. Um, I suppose if you are a working uh, mother, a working woman, and just to keep on working you know, during uh, your pregnancy uh, to take your mind away and so that you don't go and if you're at home, you know, you will go and lie down in the bed because you're feeling uneasy. That's the most comfortable thing to do. And then you have disrupted sleep in the night. So it's basically it comes to the basics. Uh, so maintaining sleep hygiene, maintaining uh, a good uh, sleep pattern and sleeping adequately in the night. Manage your cope, manage the symptoms that come during pregnancy. Of course, it is easy to say then uh, do it because of a lot of, uh, because of the hormonal fluctuations. Next question, madam. Uh, what advice can we give on posture management during sleep for OSA patients? Okay, uh, so uh, again, good question. So, um, so, there, so obstructive sleep apnea, uh, certain patients, but a good number of patients get it when they are in the prone position. They are lying on their back. Um, we, sleep that way, we see that when you do sleep studies, but this is not in all patients. And when we do a sleep study and when we detect that, um, we sometimes just uh, advise uh, sleeping on their sides. Now, sleeping on the side is not an easy thing to do. No, once you fall asleep, you start falling, moving here and there, you don't know what to do. So one thing is to put a ball, a tennis ball in your uh, in your pyjama shirt and so that when you uh, go back to the prone position you it's because it's difficult you come back and put uh, go back to your um, side this some some people actually try to do it when i was doing sleep doing clinics with same patients in during my overseas training there are some people who don't want to do anything else actually have tried that and there's some benefit um, and then you can use a pillow, sleep against a wall. Um, and there are some certain vibratory devices which, way, which wakes you up when you turn to the um, uh, prone position to put you back. So there, those are not very uh, proven uh, benefit, but there is an entity called positional obstructive sleep apnea. Um, so we do, we, and they get their predominant apneas during the prone position. Posture change can be helpful, but when it comes to moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea, that itself is not enough. There is another question, Madam, um, about uh, the treatment for narcolepsy. Okay. So, first you have to diagnose narcolepsy. Uh, so, you have to suspect uh, a, a person who comes with excessive somnolence. Uh, you have to do uh, you have to do a sleep study. Uh, you have to do a level one called a somnogram in the sleep laboratory followed by a test called MSLT, multiple sleep latency test. So uh, the diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy is that the patient enters a REM sleep uh, as soon as they, that is within the first 15 minutes of sleep. So if you remember the hypnogram I showed you earlier, uh, you start your sleep with wake, then you go on to in non-REM non sleep, and then you go to REM sleep. In a normal person, the REM sleep will come after about 80 minutes of sleep, after the first one hour, after about uh, within the first one and a half hours. So in these narcolepsy patients, they actually they enter into their REM sleep or their dreaming sleep in their first 15 minutes. So you need at least two REM episodes to diagnose uh, REM sleep and there are the diagnostic criteria. Uh, and uh, so you have to do these tests in a sleep pathology, come to a diagnosis uh, in, in, in dubious cases. Or, um, and one of the diagnostic criteria is to look for the CSF hypocretin level, hypo because the pathology of, of narcolepsy, what causes narcolepsy is a deficiency of hypocretin uh, secretion in the hypothalamus. You know, the hypocretin is the wakeful hormone. Uh, so, um, uh, so when it comes to management, there are there, there are uh, medications. Uh, they are called awake promoting medications. Uh, they fall into the group of uh, there. There are so, there are several groups. I'll just mention because you asked them. This is not in the scope of my lecture, but there is a group of amphetamines, and there is the uh, um, modafinil and the armodafinil group of um, uh, group of medications. And there are lots of other new medications that are coming up. Um, uh, so uh, uh, they have to be uh, they have to be treated and followed up in uh, people who are competent to treat these disorders. Yeah, but of course, if you suspect them, then please refer them because I think we have to create an awareness among ourselves and um, uh, and you know, as I said before, if, if someone comes with a lazy child, have that, have whether there's a sleep pathology going on. Okay. I don't, um, 
we have so many questions still coming up just shall we just limit it to the last question uh, it's again about obstructive sleep apnea and also the hyperventilation syndrome they need a bit of a summary of it on how to diagnose how to differentiate and how to treat so uh, obstructive sleep apnea i'm sure uh, you know it is the so what happens is uh, there is a collapse of the airways in the hypopharyngeal area behind the back uh, behind the back, uh, back of the throat there is collapse and obstruction of the airway uh, so uh, because it's an obstruction and i showed you the respiratory polygraphy um, uh, uh, the the report where there is uh, apnea there is complete there is cessation or there's a flow reduction uh, because of this obstruction and uh, you have to address the modifiable risk risk factors weight smoking alcohol and then you have to uh, you, you have to do the other management of uh, CPAP, mandible advancement devices, ENT referral for or for ENT surgery if, if CPAP is not working. So there's a different part of many. So uh, there's a that is for obstructive sleep apnea for obesity hypoventilation syndrome. So 80% of obesity with hypoventilation syndrome patients also have obstructive sleep apnea because the common risk factor is obesity. So when you do a patient with obesity hyperventilation, that 80% who have overlap with obstructive sleep apnea will also have obstructive sleep apnea pattern in their sleep study. And on top of that, they will have evidence of hypoventilation. That is, they, they, that, so that is a ventilatory defect. So ventilation happens in the brain stem. The, the, the ventral signals are coming from the um, respiratory centers in the brain stem. So something is going wrong there and you have hypoventilation. And when you have hypoventilation, you have uh, carbon dioxide accumulating and these patients are more lethargic and they, they are more symptomatic they have more headache uh, they have early morning headache symptoms of co2 narcosis um, and these patients uh, of course weight reduction is 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 core um, but when you come to management you can try cpap but mainly we give uh, BiPAP, if you're going to be with that type of NIV ventilation, you have to set it IPAP and EPAP. That is, you have to give a little bit of a pressure support to get, uh, get that uh, carbon dioxide washed out on top of the EPAP, which is similar to the CPAP, to overcome the obstruction. If you want more clarification, yes. I'm so sorry. That's all the time we have for today. So if you have any more questions, please email us on Office Tree. 13 at gmail.com and we will be able to send those questions over to madam and get you the response that you need. Um, other than that, uh, to conclude today's session, I think it was very pr productive and also something we really needed to touch on in our practice. Thank you very much, madam, for being so considerate and very informative on this lecture and taking your time to explain to and give us a proper explanation on our management techniques and how to diagnose these sleep disorders. So without further ado, thank you very much participants for another very interactive session. And we hope to see you again next Sunday with another new topic, a new webinar and a new speaker. Hope you all have a great Sunday.